Welcome to Fiveable. My name is Jessica Natsum. If this is your first time on the adventure train with me, but I love teaching biology. So this is just another chance for me to talk science at people, at my captive audiences. So without further ado, I'm going to tell you about more science. But before I do that, I do want to tell you about our social media because I have to plug this because you know, I'm a millennial and it just gives me gratification when my followers goes up. So, um, but in addition to following me, I strongly recommend you follow Think Fiveable for all the news about the streams that we're posting and any events that we have. Uh, feel free to tag us if you're studying or if you're using Think Fiveable, if you have any comments or feedback, we'd love to know what you guys think because we want to make this the best platform for guys to do really well on AP tests because they're hard enough. So you might as well have some Fiveable in your corner. Um, additionally, feel free to follow me on Twitter. I put lots of stuff on there about like what my classes are doing. Uh, if you ever watch it and you're like, oh, hey, this looks cool. Tell your teacher to at me or whatever and be like, hey, how do I do this? Because I will happily share. I am a teacher for the teachers. Um, and also, if you just ever have any questions, like, help, I'm, you're welcome to tweet at me. I don't guarantee I'll answer it by the time you need the answer just because I don't really check my phone much between the hours of 7 and 5 and after 9 p.m. But Hey, you're welcome to try. You never know. I like to think I'm better than Google on a couple of topics. So that's my plug for social media. Follow it. It's great. Fiveable. Woohoo. All right. Now for what you actually came here for. The like science stuff. Woohoo. So I'm going to go ahead and shrink my screen because you didn't come here for my face. You came here for science information. Let's get real. So um, had my little intro where I talked about my life. Again, captive audience. Thanks for putting up with that. Um, and talked about my social media. Again, captive audience, thanks for putting up with that. I just like to talk to people and tell them things and try to get them to follow me on Twitter because I'm a millennial, that's what I do. Um, but now let's get into the stuff you actually came here for. So you should have already had a stream on enzyme structure and function at some point before this, hopefully, if our schedule worked properly this week. Um, and that enzyme structure and function was um, going to really introduce this unit because this whole unit is about energy and how we power what we do, um, how we give our bodies energy so they can move around and dance and sing and do these songs or whatever. Um, and so now we're going to get into how we do those processes efficiently. And to do that, I'm going to take you back to like the first unit you did on proteins. And you're going to be like, I hated this the first time. I don't want to do it again. And I'm going to be like, tough. Um, yeah, exactly like that. Um, then we're going to talk about enzyme catalysis, the thing you actually came here for. Um, and so enzyme catalysis, um, uh, for any of you who have not seen the Fast and Furious movies, um, which is an American franchise treasure, obviously, about people who like to drive cars fast. Um, it, it's literally movies about people who like to drive cars fast. But I think of enzymes as those fast cars. You could drive down the road at 60 miles an hour and get where you're going at your legal pace. Go to legal pace. I'm not saying don't go to legal pace. You cannot say I didn't do that because I'm saying it right now on the internet and it's recorded. But if you're in Fast and Furious, they go like 200 miles an hour and they get it done more quickly. So that's what I always think of when I think of enzymes. Um, I think of this weird <laughs> gif of Sonic the Hedgehog. Yes, that is Sonic the Hedgehog. I don't know why he's drawn like that. I just know a kid shared that with me when we talked about things that go fast in enzymes. And ever since then, I'm like, it's a treasure. I'll keep it. Enzymes make things go fast. They make things go fast. That's the main thing you've got to get down. But there are some things that can happen that may prevent them from going quite as fast as you like. And that may make you sad because sometimes you may be like, oh, I don't really need that. But then sometimes it's an enzyme, like the thing that's breaking down the dairy and the ice cream you ate. And if that stuff doesn't get broken down, it's no bueno. So you really kind of need them to actually do these jobs. You don't really want them to be interfered with. We're going to get into all of that. And finally, we're going to have some AP practice, AKA the things you all come here for in the first place so that you can learn about them. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get this show on the road then. All right, so let's talk about protein structure for a minute, because if you don't remember this from 5,000 years ago, I need you to put it, pick it up, open your brain, and put it back in your brain. Uh, if you are like me, you probably cram a lot. Like, I'll be perfectly honest. I'm in grad school right now. 
all my assignments are due Sunday at midnight. So, you know, when I'm doing my homework, Sunday at midnight. Um, so I get it. I've been there. And cramming, you don't necessarily remember stuff as well as if you've been studying it long term. So I thought I'd do a little review with you. So if you remember, proteins are made of amino acids. There are four levels of protein structure. Which level of protein structure is the one where you put a bunch of different proteins together? Which level of protein structure is the one where you put a bunch of different proteins together? Ooh, Soleil, no. One primary structure is when you put a bunch of amino acids together. Shreya, that is cor correct. Quaternary structure, you can see that here. I'll get my little pointer. You can see we've got like this green, orange, purple, blue. That's because those are multiple enzymes or multiple proteins all coiled together. So this happens pretty frequently. I've got some of these here. Um, if you ever see 3D representations of proteins in like a lab, this is what they look like. They don't look like you know, that cute little um, Pac-Man thing that your teacher draws on the board where it's got like a pizza cut out or whatever. That's not what it looks like. That's not real science. I mean, I'm sure out there somewhere there is an enzyme that is shaped like Pac-Man, but the majority of them look like this, this little squiggly mess here that you can see. Um, and then this little squiggly mess. And then this little squiggly mess. We like our proteins to be squigglies. That's all they are. They're just a bunch of coiled up chains of amino acids. Oh, it's okay, Soleil. Um, don't worry, there's another question and your time to shine is coming. But that's what proteins do. They're just coiled up chains of junk and they fold. Why do they fold and coil in the first place? Why do proteins fold and coil in the first place? brain. Why do proteins coil and fold in the first place? Hydrophobic amino acids. Okay, that's one reason. So the hydrophobic and the other hydrophobic comes together and binds because we know like mixes with like. Very good. What other kind of stuff is going to make them bond together? There's very specific kinds of bonds. Hydrogen bonds. Very good. Um, those things where you've got a slightly charged end and another slightly charged end and they're like magnets, they go Zoop! So yes, that's one. So proteins are gonna have this primary structure. So all primary structure is, is a chain of amino acids. I'm not gonna go as far back as amino acids. You need to do some Google or check your notes. But the primary structure is the amino acids all strung together in a chain. They've got an amine group and a carboxyl group, and they just go bloop, 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 bloop. They're all chained together. But what is different about every amino acid? What is different about every amino acid? R group. Very good, Tria. You're on a roll tonight. So all of these R groups, R in science is kind of like the X of math. X can mean anything in math, right? In science, we don't use X, we use R. I don't know why. I think it's just to confuse people like me. When you see R, it just means it could be anything. It could be replaced, R, remain, replaced by anything. And so different interactions between these R groups, whether they're polar or nonpolar, or if they're, um, they are capable of hydrogen bonding or disulfide bonding or whatever other bond, they're gonna bond together and they're gonna coil up. So if you've seen my act before, You've seen me pull out my tape measure. Okay, and we're gonna pretend this is a chain of amino acids, just a long chain of amino acids. And now let's say I've got a polar piece and another polar piece. Polar mixes with polar, so those two are gonna to come together. And let's say I've got another piece here, but it's nonpolar. And then down here at the end, I've got another nonpolar piece, so those are gonna to come together. And it's all just gonna keep binding and binding until it's this tangled up little squiggly, much like this squiggly on your screen. See the similarity? So that's your protein structure. It's a highly, highly, highly specific shape due to those reactions and bonds amongst the amino acids. Here's where this is important though. Let's say 
you're supposed to have a certain polar bond, polar R group that will bind to another polar R group so it can fold together. What if there is a mutation and that polar group is gone and now you just have one on its own all by itself? It's sad. Is that protein going to fold into the same shape? Denatured? Um, so, Lisa, just be a little careful. When we say mutation, mutation means the protein isn't even formed. It never even begins. It just, it may form, but it's going to be wrong from the get-go. Denatured means it did exist. It did its job. It just basically got shocked by temperature or pH or whatever else it was, whatever other environmental factor. But that's a very good use of that vocabulary. So if we have a mutation and the protein doesn't fold the same way, is it going to have the same shape? No, very good, Sandra. Very good, Soleil, very good. No, if you've got a mutation, the protein's not gonna fold the same way. So you can see down here where we have something called denaturation, and we'll get to that, but ignore that little block right now. But let's say there was a mutation and this blue strand wasn't formed at all. Maybe it was missing methionine, the start codon, and it couldn't, it couldn't make anything. So all of a sudden now all you would have was this red, white, yellow, and green, no blue. Would that enzyme have the same shape? Would it be able to do the same stuff? No, it would not be able to do the same stuff. And if that's a really important enzyme, like say one that breaks down toxins in your liver, you don't need new liver. So <laughs> could get complicated depending on what you use that for. Okay, I think I've beat the protein structure into your brains pretty sufficiently, but does anyone have any final questions about protein structure? Three, two, one. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next slide. Let's talk about a little bit of vocabulary here. So I don't normally put these many words on these slides because quite frankly, I think you get enough words thrown at you at school. But this is kind of one of those opening things where I need to make sure we all have the same lingo and we're all speaking the same language or you're gonna be confused and I'm not gonna know how to help you. So let's go ahead and get this stuff down right. If you wanna take a little picture with your phone or take a screenshot or uh, this is the best way you do it, you just take some notes on some paper, um, either one. If you haven't written this stuff down before, you may wanna do so now. So enzyme catalysis is when you have an increase in the rate of a process of an enzyme, which is a specialized type of protein. There's so many words there. So let's break that down. An enzyme is a type of protein you're increasing the rate of the process of the enzyme. You're making the enzyme do its job faster. So instead of having a slow, leisurely 45 miles per hour, that's when you're in Fast and Furious, you put the NOS in the tank and then the car goes like 300 miles an hour in like five seconds. It's awesome. <laughs> I've never ridden in that kind of car, but it sounds amazing. It goes faster. It is more efficient, which is technically Fitter. It's better for survival and reproduction when it's more efficient and when it's more efficient with its energy. So that's all enzyme catalysis is. Another word that we use for enzymes is catalyst. If you've ever heard the word catalyst, we say that enzymes are catalysts. That is, they start reactions and they do it very quickly. I want you to think, has anyone here ever um, made a bonfire or like a fire in your fireplace before? like an intentional fire, not like an, oops, I left the stove on. Okay, so Lay's made a fire. Okay, Sandra's made a fire, good, good, good. You've all had your proper dose of like Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts or whatever. Okay, so when you build a fire, there are ways you can do it. We've all seen the cartoons and the movies where they take the two sticks and they're like, I will make fire and they rub the two sticks together. And these are scissors, but you get the point. And they put the stick down and they take the other stick and they go, I will make fire. And they're like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And you come back to them like four hours later and there's still no fire. And you're just like, man, you should have brought some kindling or some newspaper or some matches or some fire fluid, gasoline, whatever. 
the general reaction is kind of like when you're going like this. Yeah, it works, but it takes forever, and that wastes a ton of energy of you going back and forth like you're in a violin competition with Lindsey Sterling. And why do that when you could not? <laughs> when you could plan ahead, go to Walmart, buy yourself some lighter fluid, pour it on the fire, strike a match, and then whoosh, you have made fire. I don't know about y'all, but that sounds way easier to me. I would rather get the lighter fluid or crumple up some newspaper um, and do it that way because I have no patience. I have no time to wait for fire. That's why I live in a house with a stove. <laughs> you get my point. I'm going on a tangent here. Enzyme catalysis is going to make processes go faster. It's going to make, um, it's like that lighter fluid. It's like that kindling that makes the fire go whoosh. And it takes a lot less energy as opposed to you sitting there going, yeah, I will make fire. So this is all very specific, though, because remember what I said about proteins? They have to be a certain shape. If they're the wrong shape, they don't work. It's not going to happen. It just won't. Um, so, like, for example, you can look here. I've got an enzyme. And I've got a substrate. A substrate, all that is is the thing that is reacting with the enzyme. That's all it is. And so you can see one part has this circle shape and one has a triangle shape. What if both of these spots in the enzyme was a triangle shape? Would this reaction work? It wouldn't work. Why not? Why wouldn't it work? because it wouldn't fit. Very, very good. There's this thing called the active site, and that's in this case where these little circles and triangles are. And if it's not fitting, that means the active site isn't connecting. It's like when you um, plug stuff into the wall. So here, I'm gonna make this bigger for a sec because y'all can use a break from all these words, right? Okay, so when you plug stuff into your wall, you have this thing, and it fits in your little power outlet down there okay and so y'all have all done this before where you try to plug something in and the first time you do it um it doesn't fit but then maybe the second time you do it it turns around and it fits we've all run into that right so that's an example of an active site it has to match or it doesn't work so for example i don't know if y'all can see this all that well but my house is old so I don't know how well y'all can see this, but I'm gonna try because science, y'all need examples. So I have these old outlets and they only have the two slots. They don't have the circle part up there. So what that means is even though I have this wonderful computer setup, half the time I can't use those outlets because it doesn't have the three prong outlet spot. It doesn't have the right active site. They don't fit together. Same thing with enzymes, whenever I have a shape change. And remember what I said, it's not gonna be a circle and a triangle. It's not, it's gonna be super complicated. It's gonna be a bunch of curly loop-de-loops on some protein uh, with a blue piece and a purple piece and a whatever piece like up here. It's not gonna be a circle and a heart or whatever. That is just an illustration to enhance your understanding. But so once it does fit, we have this thing called induced fit. And so induced fit is basically saying once these two bind together at the active site, the enzyme is gonna change its shape. And that's gonna make it kind of like hug. Yes, I said it, it's gonna hug and be closer together. And then it's actually gonna, if you look over here, whoa, okay, there it goes that shape change is gonna cause them to come apart differently. And so it may be broken apart, it may be that some things are put together, I don't know, it just depends enzyme to enzyme, but the shape's gonna change and now something has happened. It's gonna be transformed into whatever form you need, it's gonna cost less energy, and then the enzyme, if you notice here, did the enzyme ever change shape? Very good, Sandra. No, the enzyme doesn't change shape. So that's the cool thing about enzymes. 
not only are they energy efficient, they are renewable resources. Um, they are completely recyclable. So you can reuse them all day long. Anyone have any questions about this vocabulary? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and go on um, because now we've gotta apply it. So usually in my experience on the AP exam, what they love to do is show you graphs. <laughs> if you've taken an AP class, you've probably had to draw some graphs on your own. So I would be very familiar with these. So what I have here is a couple of lines. I've got a blue line and a red line. If you're colorblind, that's an upper line and a lower line. But so my upper line, the red line, is gonna be up here. If you notice, we're looking at energy. How much energy are we spending? Without the enzyme, we are spending way more energy. It's kind of like if you had a Prius versus an 18-wheeler. Which one's gonna be more efficient on the gas tank? Hint, hint, it's not the 18-wheeler. It's going to be the Prius. <laughs> So without the enzyme, this is your 18-wheeler, basically. It's taking so much more energy to break down that product or do whatever it needs. But then over here, you can see the blue line, this lower line, and this is with the enzyme. We're way down here. This is your Prius. It's taking way less energy to do the exact same thing and get the exact same product down here. Whether you're breaking down food or breaking down toxins or building something or starting a signal pathway, whatever it is, it takes less energy with that enzyme. And that's gonna cause less activation energy. Activation energy is the amount of energy to do a reaction. That's all it is. But it takes way less of it if you're using an enzyme. If I was to drive from New York to Los Angeles, again, in a Prius or an 18-wheeler, I don't know which I'd rather have. Both of those just sound awful, to be honest. But I would spend less money on gas if I had a Prius. It would take less activation energy. Does anyone have any questions about these graphs? Please think about them while I grab my charger because I did not plan well. I know you were all really worried. Any questions? Are we all pretty sold on our Priuses versus 18 wheelers? <laughs> all right, on with the show. All right, so let's take a look at a specific example. So, oh, it's a baby eating ice cream. I want ice cream. That's how I look every single time I see ice cream. I'm just like that little kid. I'm like, give it to me. But let's look at a specific example involving lactose. So lactose is a carbohydrate. It's a disaccharide. That is, there are two monomers put together. And it is in all of the amazing foods that I love. I love cheese and yogurt and ice cream. And milk's okay, like with like hot cookies or something. Ooh, so Leo, see so you have a question. Um, so the change in shape to hug the substrates is different than the actual change in shape. That's the, they are the exact same thing, Soleil. It's called induced fit. So those are the same thing. So it's gonna hug it, the shape changes during the hug and that's when it pops out completely different. That's called induced fit. Does that help? Yes. Yes, it would have a very different function. So let's, let's take a look at that right now with this example with lactose. So let's say you're like, you're this baby and you are so happy to be there because you got ice cream. Um, so you've eaten some ice cream, it travels down, it's in your belly, you're real happy, you kind of want to take a nap, but you're kind of on a sugar high. This is the daily struggle I go through after I eat ice cream. You've eaten the lactose, it's in your belly, it's a disaccharide. What do you need to do with that disaccharide? What do you need to do with this disaccharide? Break it down, very good. Very good, Soleil, very good, Sandra. Because remember, we wanna get these bad boys over to the mitochondria so that we can get ATP out of them. And we can't get ATP out of lactose. Now, if you're lactose intolerant, you can't break it down. And I honestly think that's one of the medical crises. <laughs> 
because you need cheese in your life. Um, but it's true. Unfortunately, if you're lactose intolerant, your body is not able to break down lactose because for whatever reason, there's no lactase enzymes in your belly. You got other stuff down there, acids and whatever, but there's no enzyme. And so those lactose just sit there and eventually will make you ill. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. I feel bad for y'all. But if you're like me, you have lactase in your stomach. You have enzymes. And so that lactase, let's just pretend this purple thing. Again, it's not going to look exactly like this, but you know what I mean. Um, this lactase is here. It's got an active site. It's going to fit with the substrate. In this case, the lactose. It's going to hug it with that induced fit. And then when it comes apart, it's going to break apart. And now your mitochondria can say, woo, glucose, I'm going to break that down and get some ATP. It's going to fit right. And that's what it does. That's all it is. It's breaking it down. And then keep in mind the enzyme again. It's able to go on and live its happy life and do some more enzyme catalysis. It just keeps going and going and going and taking way less energy to break it down. So now you've got glucose and galactose that you can go and get ATP out of. So coming back to your question, Soleil, about a different function, they have different structures. It's not lactose anymore. It's glucose and galactose. If something has a different structure, does it have to have a different function? Yes. Soleil, Shreya, very good. Um, when we're talking AP bio, different structure means different function. It may be a similar function, but it's a different function the majority of the time. Um, everything is slightly different, and that's good because we need multiple different things to do, multiple different jobs to keep these chaotic bodies of ours alive. But so, yeah, once you break it down and change it, it's going to have a different function. It may be that the function now is just waste, something your body needs to expel. It may be that it's glucose and you can get ATP out of it. It just depends on the substrate that you're breaking down. Would the enzyme have it? No. Okay. Very good question, Soleil. The enzyme does not have a different function because remember, as we go through this cute little process, does the enzyme ever change its shape? Does, no. Very good, Shreya. The enzyme's shape never changes. The shape of the substrate changes. A little for induced fit. Mm. All right, so you're getting me on some technicalities here. What I would assume, and I am not a cell biologist, here's what I would advise for my students and for the questions I know will be on AP tests. Even if the enzyme does change its shape a little for induced fit, you can look on graphs like this and see even if it does change, by the time that substrate leaves with its different shape, the enzyme is back 100% the same. So throughout the whole cycle, it may change, but by the time it gets back to the beginning, it's the exact same thing. And that's good because then we can recycle it and use it again and it can go, oh great, Jessica ate some more ice cream. I need to go break down some more lactose. Does that make more sense, Soleil? Okay, good. Good, good, good. Does anyone else have any questions before we move into practice AP question time? Three, two, one. All right, let's go. All right, let's take a look at a practice question. So like I said, uh, this unit's a lot of graphs, lots and lots and lots and lots of graphs because it's all about energy and blah, 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 blah. So the diagram below shows energy changes in a specific chemical reaction with and without the addition of an enzyme. Which of the following questions can best be answered by the diagram? What do y'all think? I see A. I see A. Give me one more, Sandra, you say A too. Eek! OMG, y'all are so smart, it's A! Does that reduce the activation energy? Yes, because if I was to draw some little arrows out here, some measurements for the enzyme, I only need this amount of energy in this one line. But if I didn't have that enzyme, I'm driving my 18 wheeler to New York, New, York, New York again, and it's gonna take all of this energy because I gotta get diesel instead of E85. Very good guys, good first round. All right, let's do another one. 
So for this one, this is long and there's a big table and I'm gonna warn you there's two parts. After this question, there's another question that uses the same table, table so get familiar with it now. Amylase is a protein that catalyzes the conversion of starch to simple sugars. Amylase activity in an aqueous solution can be measured by using iodine as a starch indicator. A solution containing iodine and starch will have a dark blue color, whereas a solution containing iodine but no starch will have a light brown color. The color change of an iodine solution from dark blue to light brown can be used to measure the rate at which starch is converted to simple sugars. Is starch a monosaccharide or a polysaccharide? Polysaccharide, very good, Shreya. And so this is when we're breaking it down using that amylase into those single layers. So a student designs an investigation, an experiment to investigate the effects of environmental pH on amylase function. The design of the experiment is presented in table one. Which of the following statements best justifies the inclusion of test two V, V is a Roman numeral for five, as a control in the experiment? Why do we need that? And I know my face is in the way of the ABCD, so y'all know how to count ABCD. What do y'all think it is? What are we thinking? Okay, I see C. Drum roll. You guys are so smart, that's two for two. Absence of enzyme activity. Very, very good. Any questions about this problem? You all got it right, so I'm assuming you're good. Um, but I also know there's two other people watching. So if you have a question, please feel free to pop down to the ask a question button. If you want it to be like more anonymous or something, I don't know if you can do that, but I'm happy to help if y'all are watching. Amylase is a protein, but remember proteins are enzymes. Enzymes are like special types of proteins. Does that help? Does that make sense? C says absence of enzyme. It doesn't say absence of enzyme. It says absence of enzyme activity. So it's not necessarily is the enzyme added, it's is there activity of the enzyme? Does that make sense, Shreya? Gotcha, okay, good. Yeah, you have to read these things super carefully or it makes your brain hurt. Okay, let's take a second, a look at the second part of this question. So same thing, amylase, breaking down starch, got your iodine, blah, blah, blah. But which of the following statements best justifies the inclusion of test tubes three and seven? So those are gonna be Roman, num Roman numerals, I, 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 and VII, or you can just count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> so why do we have those? Why do we need test tubes three and seven? Why do we need test tubes three and seven? Okay, I see D. Sandra, Soleil, what are y'all thinking? D? All right, let's take a look. Mm. My heart, it's okay. Let's talk about it. They will show whether the isolated cellular contents have enzymatic activity. 
cellular contents. It's talking about the starch. It's talking about the, I, the amylase. In three, you don't add starch, which is where it was getting y'all for D. But you do add amylase. In seven, you've got both of them there. So it's seeing how it acts when it's isolated, when it's on its own, just amylase, versus when you've got seven, you've got the starch and the amylase together when it's not isolated. Does that make sense? That was a really tricky one. Okay. Sandra, Shreya, do y'all have any questions about that one? That one's tricky. It took me, when I was going through these questions myself a couple hours ago to make this, I was kind of like, hey, at first. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Stop me if you need me. Let's take a look at a practice FRQ. These are fun. So we're gonna take a look at this practice FRQ. So again, charts, <laughs> that's all this is. So an experiment was conducted to measure the reaction rate of human salivary enzyme, alpha amylase. That's the stuff in your mouth that breaks down your food, not your teeth, your spit. 10 milliliters of a concentrated starch solution and one milliliter of alpha amylase were placed in a test tube. The test tube was inverted several times to mix the solution and then incubated at 25 degrees Celsius. The amount of product maltose present was measured every 10 minutes for an hour. The results are given in the table below. So what we're seeing here is time and maltose. Where is the maltose coming from? Where's the maltose coming from? The starch, very good, Tria. So the starch, when it's getting broken down by the alpha amylase, it's turning into maltose. Because you're spit. Very good. So we're looking at this and over time, we're having a change in the concentration of maltose in the test tube. So it starts out there's no maltose because what do we have at the beginning? We don't have maltose, we have starch, very good. But as time goes on, the alpha amylase is reacting and induced fitting and active siting and catalyzing with the starch and turning it into maltose. Very good, Tria, very good, Soloy. And so over time, we're getting more and more and more maltose here until you get to 30 minutes. And then we go from having zero to five to eight to 10, and then we just plateau. So Shreya says the substrate starts to run out. What do you mean by the substrate is running out? What do you mean by that? What is the substrate? There is no more starch to catalyze. <laughs> Nothing left to break down. Bingo. High five. Y'all are getting it. Perfect. That would be your explain. Then it says graph the data on the axes provided and calculate the rate of reaction for the time period of 0 to 30 minutes. So we can't really graph this together, so I'm just going to kind of go over how this one works. Um, does anyone have any questions left about the explain part? All right, I'm gonna go, here we go. So here's the rubric, like the official AP Bio one for the explain part, two points. One part is just for saying, um, what is the change? And that's the reaction rate is slowing. If you said the reaction rate was increasing, you would lose points. The other point is for explaining why does it change? Why does the reaction rate slow? And so what um, Shreya said is perfect. You're running out of substrate. There's no more starch to catalyze. That's perfect. Any questions about this rubric for the explain? Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the graphing part. All right, so this graphing part, <clears throat> excuse me. 
So it's gonna have four points maximum. If you have done an AP style FRQ before, you have done a graphing question. I always tell my kids when I give them a quiz, because every time I give them one, there is a graphing question, do the graphs first, because for doing something that you learned how to do in seventh grade, you get three points. And in AP land, that's a lot of points. All you've got to do is make sure you make your graph correctly. You've got to use the right independent and dependent variables. Make sure you put them on the proper axes. Okay, the dependent variable is almost always going to be some form of time or reaction rate, something that changes over time. That's always going to be on the x axis. Dry mix, yes, delay. My kids actually taught me that last year. I was like, what is dry mix? Because I kept finding it written on their papers. And I was like, dry mix? Do, you, do y'all need to go to the grocery? What are y'all talking about? Yes. So, very, very good. Dependent is going to be on that y or bleh. I'm getting it backwards already. I'm sorry. It's been a long day. But again, that time is going to be on the X. The independent is going to be on the Y because it's going to be changing over time. Um, and so just putting those on the right axes is going to get you a point. The second point is going to be having the correct units. You can't just write time. What kind of time? Seconds? Minutes? Milliseconds? Who knows? In science, we need to know these things because our brains are control freaks. You've got to put the correct units. So many times my kids have lost points because they forgot to put their units. And it's only one point, but when you could have had three, it makes you sad. And the the third point is just for doing that thing you learned in seventh grade, putting the data points where they belong. It's almost always going to be a scatter plot. I have seen an occasional bar graph. That's usually when they ask you about standard deviation, uh, which is a topic for another time. But for a graph, that's all you need. You need to put the maltose, the concentration, the time, and then same as we talked about here, it just plateaus off after about 30 minutes. Any questions about the graphing part? Three, two, one. Yes, you get a calculator on the exam. Um, If your teacher tries to tell you no, um, and they may just not want you to have one during like class because to be honest, most of this math you can do without calculators. They're not gonna ask you to find like the limit of some massive calculus equation, but you can have it. So if your teacher's like, no, you can't have it in like my class test, I'm not fighting your teacher, I know better than that. But on the actual AP, AP test, you're supposed to get a calculator. So I'm going to move on before some teachers are rewatching this later and they're like, don't tell my kids that. Um, let's talk about the calculation part. What kind of equation is that? What kind of equation is it asking you to do? It's a slope. Exactly, Shreya. It's just a slope equation. Taking an initial measurement, taking a final measurement, blah, 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 blah. Y'all know the math better than I do, to be honest. But notice you've got to calculate it. That means you have to show your work. On AP tests, if you don't show your work, they're like, how do we know they didn't just pull that number out of thin air? They don't. You've got to show that work. So notice here it says there's no points if the setup is incorrect or if the calculated number is wrong. So not only do you have to show your work, you have to get your work right. There's no partial credit. It's only for one point which is nice because all that math is only one point. But at the same time, it's like, oh my gosh, I can calculate a slope and I really want that one point. (laughs) Any questions about the calculation? Wait, how do you use the equation? Okay, so Soleil, it's a slope equation. So do you see, and I know it's not formatted here well, but there wasn't really a way, Google Slides was not cooperating a couple of hours ago. So it's this 0.3 minus 0.4 micrometers per minute or one micrometer over three minute, 10.4, da, da, da. It's a slope equation. We're looking at the rise over run. So And guys, I am going to warn you, this is where my skills are weak. I am not a math teacher. 
I tell my kids this a lot. I'm really good at math if you can do it in an Excel sheet. Um, I'm not as good at it. And I can do it, but I can't explain it well. So bear with me for just a second because I want to get you the help you need. So when you are calculating rates of reactions, on, I want to make sure I tell you this right. You are looking at a reaction that has the change in the concentration over the change in time. So we're looking at um, the way that I always think of this is like a final minus an initial. So uh, between zero and 10, let's talk about zero and 10. And you can pull this from any of them. It doesn't matter which one, they will take any of them. Um, but I'm gonna do zero and 10 just for the sake of this example. So between zero and 10, and I'm gonna make this half screen so you can see my lovely math. So, oops, wrong one. Y'all don't need to see my homework, it's a mess. Um, Whenever you see a triangle, I know this is backwards, bear with me, but whenever you see a triangle, that means change. Triangle is the Greek symbol for delta. Delta means change. So change in concentration over change in time. So if we are going from zero to 10, so I'm gonna do my concentration first. I had 5.1 after I originally had zero. So my change, 5.1, I know this is backwards, bear with me, they haven't figured out how to fix this yet. 5.1 minus zero, that's our change in concentration. How much has it changed since 10 seconds ago? And then we have how many seconds has it been? Well, it's been 10 seconds, just 10 more than when we had zero. So we're gonna get 5.1 over 10, very good delay. And if you, punch that into the calculator that you will be awarded, which is not your phone. 5 point, whoop, not 51, 5.1 over 10, it's gonna give you like 0 0.51, ta-da. You just wanna show that it's a change over time. Rise over run, blah, blah, blah. Did that help, Soleil? Okay, cool. And if your teacher wants you to do that equation a different way, listen to your teacher they will tell you that when you get to this part, if you are not there already, um, they may have a different way. They want you to set it up or show your work. That's just what I use with my kids um, because it's the simplest, not for them because they're all in AP calculus, but for me because I didn't go past college algebra. <laughs> Any questions about this FRQ problem or any of the other problems or topics that we've talked about? Alrighty, y'all. Go team. We learned stuff today. So congrats, y'all. You just learned all about enzyme catalysis in 52 minutes or less. So if y'all don't have any more questions, I'm just, just going to do my plug. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube at Think Fiveable. Also, feel free to follow me. Tweet at me if you have any questions. I can't guarantee that I'll answer quickly, but I'll do my best to help you once I do see that notification. Um, thank you so much for coming, Sandra. It's so good to see you again this week. Um, but I hope you guys have a great night and tweet me if you have any questions. Bye-bye.